Um, real quickly, I mean, most of you guys know me. I'm I'm out and about. Um, this is actually from a presentation on um, more heaters. Some of you guys uh, look in on my uh, virtual classes that I do some evenings, and I did one on tankless and storage tank water heaters a while back. And I, and I just pulled this from there because um, I don't change this information much because I, I think it's so important. Um, most of you know, I was a plumber. I, I still have a plumbing license, master plumbing license. Next year will be 50 years since I really got out there and started working full time in the business. And that's one of those things, TPR valves, I think initially when I got in the business, I didn't appreciate the importance. I certainly did not understand exactly why these things, you know, tripped when I first got in. Nobody actually explained it. So over the years, you know, I'm working on things and doing things and I started studying and I realized one of the things that I think a lot of us think is that they go off primarily because of too much pressure. But if you if you do research and, and you look at the explosions that we have, they're mostly going off because of too much temperature. And the original or the earlier TPR valves were not TPR valves. They were just pressure relief valves. So uh, there's video of Watts doing a test and they're pointing out the importance of the, the temperature part of this valve. They'll take a water heater or tank, I guess, and they would pump it up on pressure and hit it with like a pickaxe. And, you know, it'd have a lot of pressure on it, but it would more or less just kind of gush out or spray out. It certainly wouldn't jet the tank across the, you know, across the neighborhood or something like that. So it's, as time's going on, I, I, like I said, I've realized the importance of that. And and if I hear someone say they, they go off primarily because of too much pressure, I usually correct them and explain to them it's it's too much temperature. And the, the reason... The reason it can do that is because the water in the tank is under pressure. And water typically, you know, water's going to boil at 212 degrees at atmospheric pressure, but the water in the tank is under a lot of pressure. So the water gets superheated. And with the superheated water in there, and I don't know exactly how high it could go. I'm sure it's pushing 300 degrees in some cases. But as that water begins to escape a tank, you know, a tank fails some way or a crack or a split or whatever, and it be, and that superheated water begins to leave the tank, now it hits atmospheric pressure and it's going to flash off. And anytime you ever read reports on these things, it's like it rocketed across the neighborhood, you know, it blew the walls out, it, all these things. And it's, it's really, you know, the releasing of this steam through the opening. And, you know, I always say, hey, we can move a we can move an old locomotive with steam. We can sure move a little old water heater. So I just think it's real important. And then when I get out there in the field now, I, I go out, I do some consulting and stuff like that. I'm pretty much retired from inspections. I, I sold the school recently. Uh, I do tutoring. If people want to get some tutoring, if people want to get some training, let me know. But I just don't get out there and do that every day. But when I do come across uh, a TPR valve just in my, you know, visiting somebody and I see something wrong, I tell them, you know, this is a, this is a major, major deal. Um, the TPR valves, are, they're pretty simple. They work off of temperature and pressure. Um, 210 degrees is, is typically what we'll see in 150 PSI on, on most of the storage tank heaters. And what will happen is the, uh, as the pressure begins to build up or the temperature, in most cases the temperature, and it releases the water through the through the valve. Of course, what happens is the, the pressure is going to go down and as that water is escaping, it's going to be putting cold water in the tank. So that's going to take the temperature down as well. If the problem is not corrected, it's going to do it again. I mean, I've got a, I think I've got an image in here I'll show you in just a little bit of one that continually did this and had apparently been doing this over and over again about every three to four hours for at least six months. Because the guy that was 
living in the house, I asked him if he had heard his water heater acting up. And he said, yeah, it does about every four or five hours. You know, he says he couldn't remember exactly. He said, but it raises cane, then it stops. He says, and then later on it does it again. And I said, well, how long has it been doing that? He said, well, it's been doing it since I moved in the apartment. He said, that was six months ago. So the problem, of course, was never corrected. And it, fortunately, the thing kept working. So if it hadn't kept working, that you know, he could have, he could have ended up, you know, being killed by it. Um, I try to get people's attention when I teach this, teach on this subject. Look at these names, seven, eight, nine, 10, eight, eight 10, all these ages. These are children that were killed in Spencer, Oklahoma, when a water heater blew up in the cafeteria and took a, a block wall down and the wall collapsed on the people and, and it, all these children and, uh, the, uh, laid down the bottom, I believe was a teacher and it just it killed that many people. If you want to get somebody's attention, you give them, you know, you give them this information and they'll, they'll certainly pay attention to you. Um, I don't, I don't see a way to go to get these things anymore on, on the reporter website, but I wrote an article on this in 2008. So I've, I've been talking about it for a long time, but I wrote an article in the, in the reporter uh, and I and I do presentations on it and stuff like that. So again, I, I do think it's real important. But if you can find that article, there's a lot of good information you can kind of have at your at your fingertips. I pulled together some articles, just some some clips. Uh, now this is this is pretty old, but this water heater blew up in a theater and killed a boy. Um, if you look at the note on here, it says the exploding water heater, and then you go down a few lines, it says. It landed in the Pizza Hut parking lot about a block away. So that thing's sailing through the air, you know. Um, here's another one hurdled 135 yards. This is a, in a Phoenix, Arizona place. Uh, they found part of the water heater nearly 70 feet away. So, the, you know, these things do catastrophic damage in, in most cases. Um, this is pretty old. It's from the IRC, but I, I've kept it in my presentations because it, it still pretty much covers everything. Um, inspecting the TPR valve is mainly just making sure it's installed properly. Um, I, I personally, as a home inspector, do not lift the lever to test it because you got a 50-50 shot probably that they're going to continue to leak. But I do let the client know that it's recommended that it be done annually and that it wasn't done and they recommend that they do it. As a plumber, I used to get calls. People would say, can I, can I do it myself? And I would say, if you want to lift the lever, you can lift the lever, make sure you know where the water's coming out and so forth. And I almost always got a call to go there and replace it because it dripped. It dripped, it dripped afterwards. If they want me to come and test it, I didn't test it, guys. I just went there and changed it. I mean, they're going to pay me 150 bucks to be there, and all it's going to cost them is the difference in the TPR valve. So I just, I just go there and cut the line loose, take the thing out, put a new one in, and you know they're they're good to go. Hopefully for another uh, another couple of years or so. So uh, you know if you if you're going to lift it, just I mean we all know what happens. You you know you broke it. You know that's that's the way everybody looks at it. The ones I think are funny is. You know, you go there. I mean, this even happens as a plumber. You go there and the, and the sewer stopped up and you you unstop the sewer and you get a call the next day and they say the water heater's not working and you must have done something when you were here. You know, that kind of stuff. We all get it. I mean, similar things even in even in, uh, in home inspection. But anyway, let me go through the list real quick. Not directly. That pipe should not be directly connected to the drainage system. You know, usually I hear people say, well, if that thing blew off in the drainage system, you could have you know, scalding water come out of the system. But, and that certainly could happen. But one of the main reasons we don't do that is, remember, that's on the fresh water system. So you connect it to the drainage system improperly and you, you've got a cross connection. And I've seen TPR valves be dripping. And then when the pressure was off, if it was into a drain pipe that would fill with sewage or something, it probably could siphon that back into the tank. So you don't want to create a cross connection for sure. Uh, discharge through an air gap located in the same room as the water heater. Uh, a lot of you guys have basements, so you can drop these uh, above a, a, a mop sink or something like that, or a floor drain. Uh, we just don't see basements here. I'm in Virginia Beach. We don't see basements here. And the vast majority of them here actually drain 
uh, out the wall. We're we're allowed to discharge them outside. We we turn it down outside. Try to put it in a place that's um, if it blows off, it's not going to hurt anybody. But also a conspicuous place. You want people to walk by and turn and look at that thing and say, I've never seen that thing dripping water before, or I've never seen that thing flowing like that. You want want it to become you know, an issue so that they'll, so that they'll deal with it. Um, I always tell the guys here, I've had inspectors that I've worked with. I always tell them when you see one of these, you know, when you go to check one and it goes into a wall, try to see where it comes out. You know, I've seen, I've seen them build up flower beds and cover them. So the, the outlet point is actually covered. So if you can't find the discharge point, I tell them, you know, let them know you can't find the discharge point, you know, and a plumber would come in there. He would just pull the lever on it. And it would blow the, you know, the pine needles or the mulch or whatever out of the way. And then he could, you know, he could, you know, make corrections, maybe raise it if he needed to or something like that. Of course, they, the outlet can't be smaller. Um, the outlet can't be smaller than the diameter of the valve. And, you, and most of us know that we got a three quarter inch opening on most of them. We're not going to drop it down. We're not going to drop it down to half inch. You see this done all the time. And uh, I've seen it as small as a piece of 3H tubing because it was easy to run. People, you know, people would do that. Uh, it should serve a single device, uh, not be connected to uh, piping service, you know, piping with another relief valve on it or equipment. I think the thing I see with that the most is you'll have a, an air handler or a, a, an A coil or something sitting next to it, and they'll tie the condensate drain in the TPR valve pipe together. And it, it's, it's very clear. You don't tie them together. You know, you it's basically it should be an independent line. So if something's happening, you know what's going on. I've seen in apartment buildings where the the rooms are stacked, where they would come down and you would realize they got like four or five of these things tied into one pipe. Um, it would be a dog to try to figure out which one's leaking, first of all. But, you know, if, if, if a situation could occur where it couldn't handle the flow. So, we you know, independent line. Everything should have. Uh, an independent line. Uh, discharge to the floor, an indirect waste receptor, or to the outdoors. Now, outdoors is, it has to be, you know, if it's freezing, I heard somebody talking from Minnesota. I think you guys even got snow yesterday. We're not going to run them outdoors probably in Minnesota, but in Virginia, it's, you know, where I'm at, it's, it's perfectly fine. Now, the indirect waste thing actually gives plumbers a little bit of an option. I like the idea of even in a garage, sitting the water heater in a garage and sitting it in a pan and then taking the TPR valve and venting it to the pan. So that would be your, you're venting it to an indirect waste receptor. The pan is the indirect waste receptor. And then you pipe the pan outside. So if it blows, blows into the pan and the water can be carried outside. If by chance the water going through the line to the outside did freeze, it can at least still blow off because the chances are it wouldn't be freezing in the in the inside of the room or even most garages. We typically don't have a freeze unless we have a, an ice storm or something like that. So I, I, that's just an option that you can do it. But an indirect waste, the most common would, would be a pan. And in many areas allow you to take it to the pan. Um, it should discharge in a manner that doesn't cause personal injury or structural damage. You know, we I think, you know, we know personal injury with no, no vent pipe on it at all. You know, somebody's standing there and blam and hits them in the head. If the pipe's too short, it could be a problem. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. We we generally know what we're looking at there. And structural damage, probably the number one thing we think of when we're worried about damage to the house is, is in an attic. And I know some of you probably never see a water heater in the attic. It's a common thing here in my area. We put water heaters in the attic. We, right, we put it right next to the furnace or the air conditioner. You know, so we, you know, we save that footprint in the house and put it up some somewhere else so um we, you know we're going to put them in a pan and we're going to carry it outside uh what i like to do is the pans in those cases i like to take the pans as a plumber i would run a line from the pan to the soffit of the house and then i would turn it down in the soffit and, and if i can get to a soffit an outside soffit or, or somewhere where I can let it trip outside and flow down in front of a kitchen window, that's a great place for it to go. Because if it relieves in a pan and then it drains out above a kitchen window, it's usually not going to be that hot by the time it gets over there to hurt anyone, but it'll alert you. And because a lot of people look out their kitchen window, you know, you're standing there doing dishes, preparing food or whatever, and you can actually see 
water coming down, it'll, you know, you realize that's not normal. So, you, you know, you take care of it. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, discharge to a termination point that's readily observable. You know, so you want to be able to see it. You don't want it going somewhere where you're, you're never going to see it. Uh, not be trapped. The pipe should not be trapped. What, uh, it, basically, think of it like this. If, there, if a drop of water came out of it and it didn't evaporate, it should go all the way to the outside. It's not going to do that if the pipe's tilted back. Are you know you got dips in the pipe? It should have a nice clean flow. We're not talking necessarily about a plumbing trap. We're talking about the pipe itself uh, being trapped. Uh, I will tell you when they changed a lot of the heaters and they took the TPR valve from the top of the heater to the side of the heater, I started seeing TPR valves turned upright. They would take the vent and go up above the water heater and then go over to the wall. Usually they would connect to an old pipe, and when they did that, they created a trap. You know, so you, what you worry about there is something we call a rust plug. Uh, rust in water will weep, but at some point it can create a plug in the outlet and, and you know, it's not going to drain. So it could create a blockage. So it needs to be installed by gravity. That's kind of in the same vein there. Uh, not terminate more than six inches above the floor or a waste receptor. Um you know, you want it. You want it up in the air enough so it can drain and it can't become submerged. You know, but you don't want it up so high that it could hurt someone. Uh, if you raise them in garages, a lot of guys will put them on a platform. What the what I see the common mistake made there is they carry the pipe down to the platform. They don't carry the pipe down to the floor. So some of the platforms are going to be at least eighteen inches or so off the floor. So you're not within six inches of the of the floor. Uh, no threaded pipe. You know, you can't just go out and buy a nipple with threads on one end because if it drips, uh, most people, they react to, I got to stop the water dripping and they'll just put a plug in a, in a pipe or they'll, you know, screw on a cap and, and now you've created a bomb. You know, I've seen people even screw garden hoses, even though the threads are not exactly the same. You can screw a garden hose onto the pipe thread and if you have hot water trickling out of it, you'll collapse the garden hose. You know, they're carrying it outside because they don't want to flood something. And you end up with a 25 foot long collapsed hose. So it's essentially a, you know, a plug. Um, no valves or teeth innings in, into the line itself, uh, especially between the tank and the TPR valve is where I see that. Some people will literally put a shutoff valve there so they can shut off the valve and change the TPR valve without draining the heater. The, the problem you have with that is somebody may accidentally shut the valve, you know, and if you put a T in there, I'll see some, they'll put a return line for a circulator loop or something or, or a feed line from that in a T and it ends up pushing the valve out so far, the valves, the sensor, the thermostat on the valve is not really sensing the temperature in the water heater. It's sensing the a temperature in a nipple that's extending it away from the tank or or something like that. So, you know, you, you want it to be able to sense the water in the top six inches of the tank. You want it to be able to obviously see the or feel the pressure, but you want it to be able to sense uh, the temperature. The pipe itself needs to be made. Um, it, it, there's a list here in, in the code, but basically it's, it's a pipe ready for hot water. You know, copper is great, but, you know, we use CPVC and, uh, you know, and, and that's fine. Uh, PVC, you know, generally is not going to be accepted. There are some pipes you can buy at the at the supply house that kind of look like PVC, but they're probably uh, a different a different plastic when they when they sell them. And they've been approved for that. Um, and and one of the things I get asked a lot, or used to get asked a lot about, was PEX. And PEX is rated for most of it temperature wise. It, you can use it. But, you know, it used to be if you put it in, the problem with PEX is it wants to get dips in it because it's really hard. It would be like polybutylene or something. It's, it's, it's a tubing. It's flexible. It's hard to get it in with, without putting a little dip in it somewhere. So you're trapping it. But even more, the what did, I, apparently enough of these were going in. I know I was in Mississippi a while back and I saw a lot of water heaters that were vented with, with the... Um, uh, with PEX, but they, they did make a change in that with PEX, you actually, you're coming out of the valve at three quarter inch, they want you to jump up to a one inch size. So you're going to put a one inch PEX line on there, not, not a three quarter inch line. And that's, I've had people call me and say, you know, in my area, well, I still see three quarters. Is that okay? I said, well, I'm just telling you what the code says. You know, in our area, we're not allowed to cite code. In Virginia, we're not supposed to cite code. But 
you know, you the statement would be, you know, it should be vented, you know, with packs, uh, one inch packs instead of three quarter. Uh, the concern is the fittings by the time you put it on the three quarter packs, it's probably reduced that outlet to about a half inch. The fittings, the internal fittings, especially, are really going to shrink this stuff uh, down. So that, that's just some ideas. But here, I got a few pictures. We'll cut through a couple of pictures here real quick and look at it. There's a uh, uh, missing, obviously, we got to have one on there because there's no vent pipe on it at all, or leaf pipe on there. Too short. By the way, you see the date written on this heater on the left? Uh, we had a lot of heaters leaving or um, are going to back to the supply house under warranty. And the plumbers would actually take them back and they would get a warranted heater. And they, and they knew to take them back at a certain time so that they would get an additional five or six years on the warranty. Well, what the manufacturers started requiring is if you, if because they didn't always get the heater. Sometimes they just took the sticker off of the heater. So they made us write on the heaters in some cases, even though the heater might have sit on this one here, the date on the heater might have been 2002, the actual date on the heater. They made you put the original date of the heater that it was replacing on there so that your customer would know that they're only getting additional they're getting some, you know, the, the additional or the uh, uh, the remaining time on the original warranty because they were giving away water heaters left and right there for a while. So when I see this, I'll get a call. People will call me or something. They'll say, Kenny, I, this thing's got 2002 written on it, but it's you know, in on the on the data place. But somebody's handwritten 1998. And I, and I point out that it's 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 a replacement heater. So if you see that, that might be the that might be the case for you. Um the, the guy on the left here, it, that stem is too close to the wall. It, the stem's got to be able to move out for pressure or the thermostat has to be able to push it out for temperature. And it's just jammed up against the wall. That that picture actually came to me when the ASHI article was published. The ASHI article was published. And the very day the reporter came out, apparently it's up on online or something. And a woman called me and said she had just had a, uh, water heater replaced and saw that read my article and and said is that a problem I said yeah absolutely that's a problem you can't you got to be able that stem's got to go out you know and the one on the right I always tell them the problem with that is they ran out of zip ties uh, <laughs> the problem with that is they you know it's leaking and they knew if they pushed down on it it would stop dripping so they're you know they're actually making the device to blow off at a higher temperature or higher pressure so it's obviously you know, not not safe. Uh, Kenny, what's that, that popped, Kenny, Kenny, what's that Watts two ten thing? What what is that thing? The uh, the, the Watts two thing uh, ten device is one that you pipe the gas line through. So instead of relieving pressure, it shuts the gas off to the heater. It, most localities, if they do allow you to use that, because some out some areas don't allow. It. But if they do allow it, they still want a TPR valve on there as well now. But in, 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 in the past, you would just put that Watts 210 valve on there and the gas pipe, you know, comes from the wall, goes through that, through that device and then over to the gas control on the water heater. If the water got too hot, it would pop out, shut the gas off, so the burner would shut off. You know, essentially it shut the heater off. It's kind of like a high limit would work, you know, on, on some of them today. So and I don't know of too many areas I, I travel around a lot that, accept it anymore and you know and i ask all the time when i go to places plus i i learned a long time ago every time i go to a town I, I go to home depot and i look around and i can tell you know hey they use abs in this town more than they use pvc or you know the last time i was in colorado i saw uh swamp coolers i, mean, I never see a swamp cooler here I, in, you know in a high humidity area but i just thought it was kind of interesting to, how you can just go to the stores and see different things and you know if you don't see the watch 210 valve there they're probably not using it. Uh, the question I get asked is how many um, elbows are allowed? Well, the, the number is usually, especially if it's a watch, it's, it's written on the tag. And the number is four. You're not supposed to have more than four elbows or bends in the discharge pipe. It also says no more than 30, uh, 30 feet of pipe. But so I'll get, I'll get a call and they'll say, well, they had like seven elbows in there. And uh, you know, I showed them how they could do it with four, but what you can do if you absolutely have to have more than four elbows is just increase the size of the pipe. Uh, they can, you can screw a fitting into the TPR valve and jump it up to one inch 
if you jump it up to one inch, then you can use more elbows because the, you know, the, the flow is going to be able to make it through those larger elbows and it's, it's not going to be as restrictive. So it's not going to be a concern. Um, so Kenny, are, you, are you familiar with a frost tea? Uh, I think you're talking about a freeze tea. Freeze tea, yeah. Yeah. We, here, what we used to use them for was they would, you're going to run the pipe outside to drip outside. And they were afraid that if it, if it dripped outside in the winter and froze, then it has no place to relieve. So they used to make us put a tea in there. You would literally stick a pipe in the run of the tea, the top run of the tea. You would stick a, a pipe in there and you would crush with your pliers the top of that pipe so that if it did blow off, it probably wouldn't squirt out. You know, if it was running, it probably wouldn't squirt out that open pipe at the top. But if it had to blow off under pressure and there was a chunk of ice holding, holding it back, I guess they felt like the the water could press itself up through that crush pipe at the top. At some point, somebody said, you know, what are these guys, engineers? I mean, they don't know how big a crimp do you put in the pipe? You know, I mean, it was just silly. And in my area, you don't use those anymore. We did. We did for, for a while, but you don't you don't use them. It doesn't make sense. And again, if you're worried about it freezing, going to the outside, put the water heater in a pan. Take the Take the vent pipe down to the pan and run the pan outside. And then you you'll you know you don't have to worry about that. Um, this pipe we're about, here, we're about ready to wrap up, Kerry Kenny. If you okay. find, a, find a stop in place, okay. I'll uh, real quickly. I just want to show you a couple more uh, garden hose. You know, somebody and that's improper material, obviously, and of course it's it's trapped and and all that plugged. Uh, multiple water heaters tied in together. This these are all tied in together, and then they're not vented anywhere which was, I thought was really pretty amazing. Um, there's the threaded pipe. You can see it at the bottom. You know, somebody just went to the Home Depot and bought that. Uh, look at this one. I bring it in a little closer. They literally put the device in backwards. You know, so the only way this thing opens up is, is if the garage is on fire. You know, so the, otherwise it's, it's a plug. It's, just, it's essentially a, a plug. Uh, this is what they look like when they corrode and get clogged up. The the round hole at the top is where the pressure is sensed, and all that all that crud on the on the thermostat is not going to sense the pressure. And I mentioned this a minute ago, so I'll show you an actual picture. TPR valve was blowing off for six months, and I happened to go under the house, and it blew off while I was in the crawl space. And I turned and I took a picture of it. You can see the water hitting the ground here. It's washed this big area out. So you're thinking, okay, well, the house was high enough. I could walk around and it was on sand. The problem was it wasn't a conspicuous place. So people didn't know it was blowing off. It was blowing off in the crawl space. And if you look at the bottom of that picture, that is moisture damage subfloor. There was $30,000 worth of structural damage in this crawl space because it would blow off, fill the crawl space up with steam and then just seal itself up. And then three, four hours later, it'd do it again. So... You know, you, you got to let them know. You got to let them know when that's a problem. Uh, and real quickly, I'll wrap it up with this. The replacing a heater or a TPR valve and a new heater, the, the new heaters have a lot more insulation on the side. So you have to be sure to buy the right TPR valve. There's the TPR valve. It has a shank on it that'll extend through the insulation. If you don't, and you just put one of these in here and then put a, a coupling on the end of it and a nipple, to extend it through there, it's it's going to be sensing the temperature in the pipe, not in the heater. So people say, well, how can I tell that? If you see a coupling on the end of something sticking out and it's going into it, it's it's probably the wrong the wrong TPR valve. So uh, real quickly, yeah, we use pressure relief valves on tankless. You know, the chances of them being a real problem, they got a lot of safety devices built in anyway. Chances are pretty pretty slim, but you know, it's it, it's possible. So. Oh, uh, that'll do it.